if you're in the book of Genesis chapter 24, will you follow along? I'm going to read for quite a little while. We just sang, Unto thee, O Lord, do we lift up our souls. Show us your ways and teach us your paths. We're opening up wells. Let's look at the well we're going to look at tonight, or this morning. Chapter 24, verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house. Notice the name Eliezer is not given to us here. That is his name, but it's been left out in this account. And he ruled over all that Abraham had. Look at what Abraham asks him to do down in verse 4. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Let's skip down now to verse 10. The servant, again his name is left out, took ten, camel, ten camels of the camels of his master and he departed. For all the goods, we underline this if you mark your Bibles, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia unto a city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city or outside of the city. We underline this by a well of water at, that t at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord my God, my master Abraham, I, uh, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show me kindness, show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water. Verse 14. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she say, drink, and I'll give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby I shall know. Verse 15. And it came to pass before he had even done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out. And most all of us know the story from there on that when Rebekah came out, she indeed not only gave water to this servant to drink, but watered all ten of his camels. Let's get down to verse 26. After this had taken place, it says, And the man bowed down his head. Notice how not one time has the servant's name been given. And he worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the God of my master Abraham, who hath not uh, left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, again, if you mark your Bibles, would you underline this? I, being in the way. Now that doesn't mean he was in the way. I mean, you know, we use that exp expression for people that are interfering. We say, get out of the way. That isn't what he's referring to here in the King James Version. And man, he was in the way, and we'll get to that in a minute. He said, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 says, there are wells of salvation that with joy we can open up in our lives. Last week we looked together at the well of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, Jesus was telling the disciples that it was necessary that he was going to leave after his resurrection concerning his ascension to go be back with the Father. But he said that when he would go, he would ask the Father to send another comforter. That's who we talked about last week. And it says in John 16 and verses 13 and 14, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak of himself. Notice that we put emphasis back in that well that we were looking at in Genesis chapter 24. That servant, Eleazar, who means God is my helper, is a type of the Holy Ghost. He's representative of the Holy Ghost, the one we shared last week. And when the Holy Ghost has come, it says, He will guide you, Jesus said, into all truth. He'll not speak of Himself. That's why the name was left out. He's come to lift up Jesus to us. It says, He will show you the things to come, and He shall glorify me. That's the whole purpose 
of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. He wants to guide us and draw us closer to Jesus. Now, the reason that's important is because all the way through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is represented as a guide in various different ways. We've just seen it here. The servant said, as representative of the Holy Spirit, now watch, Abraham is a type of God the Father. And he, the servant is now given instruction as a type of the Holy Spirit to go and to get a bride for Isaac, who's a type of Jesus Christ. And how many know that's what the Holy Spirit has been sent to do? He wants to guide us into all truth. He wants to give us more information about Jesus so we can fall more and more in love with him because we're the bride of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is not speaking of himself, but he's lifting up Jesus that we can get excited about going to that new Jerusalem and have that wedding feast with our bridegroom. And all the bride said, Amen. Amen. Another one of these types is found over in the book of Exodus. Chapter 40 we haven't time to turn to it now, but it says in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38, that there was a cloud that would come. It was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And whenever it says there in Exodus 40, that cloud would begin to move, the children of Israel knew it was time to pack up and they would follow that cloud wherever it went until it would rest and then wherever it would stop they would know that was the next resting place. And now that Holy Spirit is another typical, uh, typified rather, by a cloud that's there. And we can look at it and we can see that it's meant to guide us. Stephen said in his sermon in Acts chapter 7 just before he was stoned that it says that he was preaching and when he referred to the children of Israel in the wilderness, he called them the church in the wilderness. How many are grateful that we are going through a wilderness but we got the Holy Spirit that's been sent to guide us. We even sing a song, Holy Spirit, you're a comfort to me. You lead me, you guide me, in danger, you hide me. Yeah. A few years ago, the Holy Spirit made this real to me in my time of prayer and fasting one day. Actually, I believe it was God the Father and the Son that made it real. Because this was the truth that came, and I, I get emotional every time I tell it. But there's something super special about this member of the Godhead. So much so that Jesus wanted to make it very, very clear that you could sin against him and there'd be forgiveness. We could sin against the Father, forgive, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, that's the unforgivable sin. They're very, very protective of this person in the Godhead. It says in Psalm 78, verse 53, that he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them safely so that they feared not. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to know that wasn't just that cloud in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit has been sent to guide us like a tender flock in a wilderness where we don't have to be afraid because he's promised to guide us safely. Can I just go through a whole list of Psalms and we just write them down? I just want you to get them all. This is how important our having divine guidance and this well opened up in our lives is to us. Matter of fact, with God's help, we're going to be looking at it this Sunday if the Lord tarries and gives me strength and favor to return. Next Sunday, we're going to make this a two-parter because this is too much just to try to get into because how many in your life, let's just take a look. How many of you have ever been like Tarzan and Jane in the wilderness? Just swinging vine to vine and confused. How many have ever turned to a monkey to try to get... No, no. <laughs> Psalm 5 and verse 8. Listen to what David said. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Listen to Psalm 25, 4 and 5. You sang it. 
Show me thy ways and teach me thy paths. Psalm 31, verse 3, the latter part of it, listen to what it says. For your name's sake, Lord, will you lead me and will you guide me? That's God saying he's putting his name on the line that he wants to guide us in our life. Listen to this one, Psalm 43, 3. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth and let them lead me. How many know the Lord's given everything possible, light and truth, to keep our path so we can follow it? Listen to what David said in Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. David got desperate for this. Maybe some of you are at the same place. Hear me, my cry, O God. From the ends of the earth I call unto you. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I. For whom have I in heaven but thee? And whom I of earth that I can turn to? Whew. That's a desperate need for guidance. Will you look with me over in Psalm 73? I want you to see where this one is so you can mark it in your Bible. The 73rd Psalm, listen to what Asaph said in this one that he wrote. Verse 23. Nevertheless, I'm continually with thee. Thou hast held me by your right hand. Does that make anybody else feel secure? Thou shalt guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Now he repeats what David had said earlier. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there's none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fails. But God in thee is the strength of my heart. And you are my portion forever. While we're in Psalms, just look at this one together so you can mark it too. Look in Psalm 143. Psalm 143. This is the one I underlined this week. And I want you to know God did it. There was a situation going on that I was praying about. And on my time of praying and fasting on Wednesday, this was the psalm that the Lord gave me and I included it in my notes because I was getting desperate for God to do something in a situation have you ever been here where you've said this to God? Look in verse 7. Hear me speedily. <laughs> oh Lord, my spirit is failing. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me, underline this, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. Verse 10. Teach me to do your will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Whew. Let's just go home. It doesn't get any better than that. Why are we giving all of those scriptures to us? Because Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 tells us something. Why don't you turn to it together? Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. Says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. How many have in your Bible, they're the sons of God? Okay. Sisters, don't get upset about that. He leads you too. Because that Greek word, let's just camp here for a minute. It's important we understand it. Because if you'll skip down, look at verse 16. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Do you see the difference that's there? 
A little earlier, that's the Greek word, H-U-I-O-S, huechos. Huechos in the Greek. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, where it says, the Spirit bears witness with our, our spirit, that's when we get born again, that we're the children of God. That's the Greek word technon. You say, are you just trying to show off Greek? No. It's critical to our understanding this morning. Because you see, when you get saved, the moment that you ask Jesus to be your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit came. Because 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3, that's not in there, guys. It says this. It says it's impossible to even call Jesus Lord without the Holy Spirit. So the moment that you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, the Holy Spirit was there with you and you became a child of God. And that's the Greek word technon. It means you were born of that. Okay? That's why Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus in the middle of the night, remember Jesus said to him, when he asked, how am I going to see the kingdom? He said, you must be born again. Now that's the Greek word technon, when a child is born. Boom, it's there. We used to try to torment Andrew to tell him that somebody just left him at the front door. We just wanted to torment him and he's turned out relatively well after all that scarring emotionally. But as he got a little older and I started seeing things, it became apparent he not only was born in our family, Technon, but he was my huijos, son. What's that word mean? It means this. You begin to bear the characteristics of the parent. You begin to show the traits of mom and dad. Let's all just stretch our hands out towards Andrew right now. <laughs> there are a lot of people that have been born again but we've never matured to the place that we now are bearing the resemblance to our father and the way that that resemblance takes place is it says listen the spirit bore witness with your spirit that you were born again you're his child. But as many as are led by the Spirit, they're the ones that are bearing the resemblance of their Father. You see, maturity as a Christian is never measured by longevity. Did you hear that? It ain't how long you've been a Christian that impresses the Lord. Well, I've known him for 50 years. The devil's known him since eternity past. So longevity doesn't impress the Lord at all. What measures the maturity in a saint is their obedience. That's why Peter closed out his letter in 2, Timothy, 2 Peter 3. He didn't write Timothy at all. 2 Peter 3.15 he said he was praying for the people there in the church at Babylon. And he said, I'm praying that you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's grace? Grace is God's power working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's Philippians chapter 2. Verse 10. God's working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. That's what grace is all about. Now watch. And when we respond to that act of God's grace working in us and we obey it, now we grow in our knowledge of him. I pray that we will grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why there are some people, they've only known the Lord for a short time. And man, they know depths of God that people have been hanging around. They don't got it all. You want to know why? Because they may only know three things and they've obeyed all three. That means they're batting. What does that mean? I don't know baseball. Is that batting 500? Huh? That's batting 1,000. Huh? That's perfect. 
But somebody that's learned a, a hundred things and you're only doing three, <coughs> you get the picture? That's why this issue about opening the well of divine guidance is so critically important to our joy. Now, we're going to give you, the Lord willing, several things, but we're going to go slowly through the first few. Then next week we'll pick up on the rest of them and hopefully we'll come back. But before we do, how many of you right now are struggling with some decision making in your own life? Okay. How many have known what it is in your life since you've been a believer to really make some trying to get some clean words here some dumb decisions how many don't want to do those anymore I have learned something about pain it isn't always necessary there's two ways that you can learn you can learn by pain and you can learn by accepting the truth and let it set you free there's a third way. You can also watch somebody else do something stupid and go, <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that right now. Can I give you something else I just wish you'd chew on a little bit? If I was a, car if I was a cartoonist, there's a cartoon I've always wanted to draw, and that's a picture of Satan just sitting on a curb, just crying his eyes out. And, and, and someone walking up to him and saying, what's wrong? And him saying, oh, the Christians just keep blaming everything on me. Because how many know that's what we do? Well, the depth. No, sometimes it's just our own refusal to obey the guidance that the Holy Spirit's wanting to provide in our lives. Now, I only got one person for my witness I want you to know if you're here and you're going well he's picking on me he just designed this because of me Jennifer knows I've had these notes since December okay but there are some of you here I hope will get it no let's go into the notes right now will you write down the first word and the law begin with the letter S What's the first shovel full to open up the well that's been filled up in our lives? To getting the will of God. Remember we read it in Psalms where, where David said, teach me to do your will, God. Surrender. Surrender. Look with me in Psalm, excuse me, Romans 12. Romans 12. Should just be a couple pages from where you were. Romans chapter 12. I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many know it doesn't get better than good? acceptable and perfect will of God let's look at some words and let's analyze them a little bit together can we this morning we're talking about surrender do you see where we had you look first of all present your bodies a living sacrifice I won't give you the word right now because I'm going to lay some heavy stuff on you in just a second that word means this in the literal language when I looked it up where it says present your body it means place yourself 
under orders. Put yourself under the command of. I beseech thee therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, surrender to the command. I wonder if the reason we stopped singing these choruses was not because they were old choruses and we want to learn new ones. Maybe we just didn't want to live them anymore. Choruses like this. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Surrender. Placing ourselves under the orders. I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Will you take a look at that next word, present your bodies? Because if we're going to learn the will of God and be taught to do His will, how many know we've shared it before? Our bodies have five gates. You have your eye gate. You have your ear gate. You have your tasting gate. The smelling gate. And touching gate. What we all of a sudden allow to enter through those gates can become a block to God's will being able to get in. If you've allowed things that you allowed your eyes to dwell on, they can become an interference with being able to see what God's path is for our life. That's why Christian men are battling with pornography. No wonder Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I'll not look upon a maid. Why? He was searching out for what God's will was in the middle of what he was going through. And he knew he better be careful about what he was letting in his, our, our eye gate. Can I say something to all of us? You want to get messed up for sure about hearing God's voice and being able to know his guidance in our life? It's what you're letting in your ear gate. Because there's some stuff that gets so clogged up in our ear there isn't a big enough spiritual Q-tip to get it cleaned out. we got to go and get one of those hoses to clean out what some of the stuff is that we allow to clog up our earring. Some of the things were even taken into our body to our mouth gate. Some of us were the things that we've allowed ourselves over our lifetime to touch. The Apostle Paul said... Don't you know that all the other sins are outside the body? But when you commit the act of adultery, you're defiling your spirit. Why? Because it becomes something that now through touch is interfering with what God's will in our life when it's outside of what God's perfect will was. I never get tired of it because if it helps somebody else, I'm reviewing the past only for this, not to stir up or I'm under condemnation because I want you to know Jesus helped me to this day to be set free for now nearly 20 years in my life. And I want to say this when my cousin Tommy said, Phil, what you've done with your life, no wonder you're so messed up with God. And he was laying with Lou Gehrig's disease and kneeling by his bed he said, let's pray for your deliverance right now. And he took his hand and put it on my head and prayed for me to get set free from the things that I had touched that had polluted my spirit. This business gets serious in talking about, I beseech thee, therefore, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. But look at verse 2. And don't be conformed. Phillips' translation, not me, J.B. Phillips says this. It says, don't be squeezed into the world's mold. I mean, no, the world right now, with all of its political correctness and all the things, it, it's trying to squeeze us into a mold of what we're going to be. That's why I love old Tatum Kretz when he came and preached and he said, I'm tired! 
are saying, get out of the box. Let's just blow up the box. <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This morning, the alarm was set to go off at 6 o'clock. I got up at 5.15. I couldn't go back to sleep. Has anybody ever gotten upset with the Lord that he won't let you go back to sleep? I even looked at the clock and said, I still got 45 minutes. Is anybody else like Samuel, where the Lord kept going, Samuel? And you go running into the other room. Running into the other room. And finally, it took the Lord until quarter to two to go, Hey, if you come in the bathroom, I got something for you. <laughs> and I went in and closed the door so it wouldn't disturb Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle over here. <laughs> and turned the light on. And all of a sudden I knew the Lord spoke to me because that word was going on and on in my head. And I couldn't get it out. And I didn't have it for this morning. And the girls back there waited for me to write it down so I could get it into my notes. Because I had it from that sheet of paper I'd written down, but I didn't have time before I got to church to get it into my notes for church. Do you see that word transformed? Underline it. Because it's the Greek word that's the same thing as, a, 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 Laurie shared it, a, of a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon and comes out the butterfly. It's a metamorphosis. That is the word metamorpho in the Greek. But now look, look over in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul has said, that he wanted us to be careful because our minds could become corrupted, it says in verse 3, from the simplicity that's in Christ. And there could be another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus that could come along, and, and we go along with it. And then he explains something. Look at what he says. He says, <clears throat> because, verse 13, these false apostles can come into our lives and they transform themselves. Do you see that? And we shouldn't be surprised because it says in verse 14 that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Do you see that? That word transformed is not the same word that was over in Romans where it says we can go through a metamorphosis because of the Holy Spirit in our life. We don't have to be conformed to the world. We can be transformed with a mind now that can receive things from the Spirit and we can be led by the Spirit and reflect the very nature of the eternal God because He's leading us here and our lives don't have to get all messed up and all screwed up and all confused. We can have life and have life more abundant because Jesus said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you and He's going to guide you into all truth and He'll glorify me. He won't be speaking of Himself. He wants to lead you into glory. Whew. Now watch. The word here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 is a totally different word. And I want to find it for you. Carl, when you were carrying my Bible, did you take 2 Corinthians out? No, oh, there it is. Verse 13, for such are false Apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. This word here is a totally different word. It's, I'm going to give it to you just so you can hear it. The one was metamorpho. This is metashetsmasu. How many know that sounds a whole different word? Because it is. Over in Romans, it means this. It means an inward change these apostles they only have an outward change how many know that if you have a garden and it's made up to look like 
a Dutch garden. But you keep the garden and you just now make it look like an Italian garden. It's the same garden, you just have given it an outward change. You're still growing basil and you're still growing oregano and you're still growing, anybody else getting hungry? And tomatoes. If you change it from a Dutch garden to an Italian garden with the title, but you got the same stuff, that's the word that's found in 2 Corinthians 11. Just an outward change, but the same substance. The word that's over in Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed to this world. It means an inward change. How many know if you've got a garden and you were raising beans in it, but now you're raising corn in it, you have transformed that garden on the inside. How many just saw the difference? All the enemy has is the ability to deceive us with an outward change that never transforms anything in your life. The Holy Spirit wants to do a transformation on the inside. And when he does it on the inside, it works its way out. Now watch how both these words are used by the Apostle Paul. They're found over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Apostle Paul wrote about the resurrection. And he says, for this mortal must put on immortality. And this natural is going to put on that which is supernatural. You see what's happening? we got an outward thing, and it's going to be changed when I get my new body. But right now, while I'm living here, I've got God already doing something on the inside. I've already got the resurrection power working on me because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is dwelling in me and he's quickened me and made me alive that now I can hear when the spirit of God is speaking. I can listen to what he's doing. He's changed me on the inside because now I want him to lead my life. I don't want my will. I want his will. I don't want to make him do what I want him to do. I'm not trying to get him to make me happy on my terms. I've had an inward change that I want what he he wants and when that happens now he can speak to me it's surrender why don't we surrender and I'm going to stop on this part and I got uh, I got seven of these come back next week and the next week and the next week Will you look with me at the psalm that we sang, Psalm 25? Psalm 25. Look at the chorus we sang to begin. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Verse 1. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Don't let my enemies triumph over me. Verse 4. Show me your ways and teach me your paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all day long. Now look at the interference that comes into David's life. It's the other verse that I told you we didn't sing when we were doing it at the beginning. Remember not the sins of my youth. And the meek will he teach his way. I'm going to give you just one last truth and I hope the Lord will really help you to hear it. One of the greatest obstacles with the people that I know and in my own life to our being able to get the will of God in our life today and to be able to hear the word of God is because the enemy wants to remind us of the places that we've screwed up in the past. And if he can get us in the condemnation of our failures in the past. Now he'll prevent us from believing that we could have God's good, acceptable, 
and perfect will now. No, I messed up too much before. David, right in the middle of saying, Lord, unto thee I lift up my soul. Te teach me your ways. Show me your path. The enemy started coming at him with the sins of his youth. And he says to the Lord, Lord, don't remember the sins of my youth. Will you look with me over in the Gospel of John? And we'll close on this point. Now don't forget, that verse ended about, remember not the sins of my youth, but he also said, and the meek will you teach your way. Just leave that up, Brian, even though we're going to look at the other verses, okay? Because we'll come back to that at the very end. Look over in John chapter 21. Remember Jesus was with Peter in Caesarea Philippi? And when he was with, with Peter, he said, uh, hey guys, who do people think I am? They said, well, some people think that you're Elijah and some think you're Jeremiah and some think you're, you're one of the prophets. He said, yeah, but who do you guys say I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And when he did that, Jesus looked at him and said, blessed art thou Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Our father in heaven, he's the one that revealed that to you. And I want you to know something. You're Peter, little stone, but on the rock of your testimony. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, Jesus and Peter on the last night before he's going to be crucified, when he's getting ready to be crucified, Peter says, everybody here is going to screw up, but Jesus, I'll never, ever betray you. And Jesus goes, cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> Before you hear the cock crow twice, you'll betray me three times. Are you in John 21? Look with me what it says. Jesus is on the shore after his resurrection. And while the guys were out fishing, he called to them. And we know Peter looked up and said, it's the Lord. And he jumped into the water and goes up to Jesus. Look in verse 8. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land. They were dragging the net with the fishes. And as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there. Do you see that? We underline where it says they saw a fire of coals. And keep your finger here and look over in chapter 18 with me. Chapter 18. Verse 17. Then saith the, dizam, the, the, the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou, one, one of, art, art thou also one of this man's disciples? And he said, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there who made a what? A fire of coals. It was cold. Where did Peter deny Christ? He denied Christ three times at a place where there was a fire of coals. Now look, what does Jesus do? He knows Peter's just denied him. And this is the one he needs to build his church with. And if he's filled with condemnation and the remembering the sins of his past, Peter's never going to be able to hear the Holy Spirit guide him into what he needed to do. And so now Jesus in his love comes to the seashore. He doesn't even want Peter to have the remembrance that when he would smell a coal fire, that's where I denied Jesus. Three times. Jesus takes the coals and builds a fire. And he says to Peter, come here. 
Do you love me? Once. Do you love me? Twice. Do you love me? Three times. I'm going to wipe out that denial. Three. I'm going to give you three loves me. Loves me overcomes loves me not. Loves me overcomes loves me not. Loves me overcomes loves me not. And then look what he does. Verse 11. Simon Peter went up and he drew the net full of, full of great fishes. How many fish? What's your Bible say in John 21 verse 11? How many fish? A hundred and how many? Now stay with me. This is Sunday morning. I want to let you go right after we're done with this. But I don't want you to miss it because if it doesn't bless you, you ain't got a blesser. No place else in the scripture does it ever say how many fish get caught. They caught so many fish over in Luke chapter 5, it broke the net. Never counted those. What did they do? They got the resurrected Jesus. Do you think when you got a resurrection in front of you, you're going to sit there and go, just one second. Okay, one, two, three, four, a hundred. Why did the Holy Spirit put that in there for us? Because in the Hebrew, numbers are letters. Okay, all you mathematicians, let's do something together. And the Hebrew is read from right to left. Okay? So write this down. Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. Ha. H-A. Third. Ani. A-N-I. Elohim, ha, ani. Now we just read that left to right. Let me read it to you in Hebrew from right to left the way it would be. From right to left, it would be God, excuse me, I am God. Do you see it? Now watch. Let's take Elohim. That's the number we write them down? 40, 10, 5, 30, and 1. Those are the Hebrew letters that spell Elohim that are those numbers. Ha. That's the number 1 and the number 5. Ani, that's the letter 10, the letter 50, and the letter 1. Are you all ready? Add up 40 plus 10 is how much? Plus 5 is how much? Plus 30 is how much? Plus 1 is... Plus 1 is... Plus five is, lost some of our mathematicians. What are we up to? 92 plus 10 is how much? Plus how much? 50 is how much? Plus one is what? How many fish did they catch? Do you see what Jesus was so concerned that Peter not remember the sins of his youth? I am God. And on you, Peter, that just loved me three times, I will build my church. And look at what it is and we're done. Jesus said to him in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Peter, when you were young, you used to gird yourself and walk around wherever you wanted to go. But now that you've fallen in love with me, 
and now that you want me to lead you I want you to know someone else is going to gird you and they'll lead you where you don't even want to go Peter was so surrendered now to the one that was going to guide him that places that Peter wouldn't even wanted to go he would willingly go to be led by Jesus that's called surrender that's why I had the verse left up there and the meek will he guide and teach his way what's meekness meekness is yielding all of our rights when we surrender our right this is what I want I have a right to, I want it, I want, and I want to make no you'll be miserable but the first shovel full of getting out of your well is surrender and if you got anybody whispering the words of remembering your sins of your youth remember 153 fish